everybody. Uh, welcome to another one of our Q&A sessions. Um, I'm Francesca, I'm the founder of Love the Oceans, for those of you that haven't tuned in before. Um, we've been doing a series of Q&A sessions with some really cool guests. Um, and you can see the previous episodes on our YouTube. The link to that is in our bio. Um, last week we... Go on. Who did we have last week, Hannah? Oh, we had Extinction Rebellion yes. last week. Um, which is really cool. We're talking about climate change. Before that, we've had um, photographers, underwater photographers, award-winning photographers, film camera camera people, musicians, scientists, conservationists. We have uh, Francesca. Hi. Oh, hi, Francesca. Hi. Thank yeah. you for having me. No worries. Thanks for coming on. Um, I was just uh, giving a brief intro to what we're doing um, to our followers and um, for our followers, do you want to explain who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Francesca. Um, I'm an artist, photographer and storyteller, also born explorer. And I use uh, the power of, of adventure in my work to try and communicate the wonders of this planet and hopefully make people fall in love uh, with the ocean especially. Um, about a year ago I started a project called 200 Sharks where my mission is to dive and paint with 200 different species of shark and ray to raise awareness about how amazing the species is and to hopefully um, make you guys fall in love with them as much as I have because I believe that when you love something you'll do anything to protect it. 100% definitely. Um, for your followers that are tuning in now and might not know who we are, um, we're a marine conservation organisation. Um, I'm also called Francesca. <laughs> and, great name. Francesca, <laughs> but, um, yeah, great name. Um, and uh, yeah, so we are a charity. We're trying to establish a marine protected area um, in Jangamo, which is where we're based in Mozambique. So we do a bunch of different research and community outreach. Uh, we do fisheries research, humpback whales, coral reefs, ocean trash, um, marine megafauna, and two community out outreach projects. Uh, and um, yeah, we started this Q&A series because obviously Corona has meant that um, our research activities are really limited um, and we wanted to still kind of spread the word of conservation and give people all that kind of conservation fix. So we, we started the series and then we're inviting awesome guests on like yourself. Um, Thank you. And, and yeah, conservation in general. Um, so that's us in a nutshell. Uh, before we start, do you want to say anything or anything like that? Well, I hope everyone's well and that COVID-19 isn't affecting people too seriously and that also to use this time to be productive, to get creative and to do things maybe that you've been pushing off uh, to the back of your mind for a while. I know I have, so yeah. <laughs> Um, what country are you in at the moment, out of interest? Uh, oh, I'm in England. So, yeah. I know, you're British too, right? Time difference isn't too bad then. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm in Mozambique, but um, I'm British originally. Um, awesome. So, yeah, but the time difference is only an hour, so it's not crazy. It's not like it's the middle of the night or crazy early morning, or you, as it has been for some of our guests. Um, also, just a heads up. So uh, the way that this is working right now, I'm um, listening to your audio um, rather than seeing you just because I'm... ...calling our social media girl in England and because um, the internet is rubbish in Mozambique. Um, so so uh, the way that this is working right now, I'm um, listening to your audio um, rather than seeing you just because I'm calling our social media girl in England and because um, the internet is rubbish in Mozambique. Um, so um, I can't see the questions that will be coming up through the live. Um, so people tuning in, feel free to submit questions as we go. Um, but Francesca, if you can keep a eye on any questions that are sent in and then just jump on them as we go, sure. um, feel free to interrupt me with them. Okay, cool. So let's get stuck in. First question we were sent, um, how did you get into what you do now? 
Right. Uh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, so I've always been an artist since I was a little girl. Um, I was a born creator and I've also been a born explorer since a little girl too. I've always been fascinated with the world we live in. But um, what I think is a surprise to a lot of people is that I had a phobia of the ocean growing up. Um, I wasn't into jumping. I'm from the UK. I, I didn't live anywhere near the ocean. And so growing up, it was all about hiking up mountains, not diving into the ocean. Um, and it was only when I was 13 that um, I learned scuba dive. And so um, scuba diving taught me that fear is all in the mind. And that kind of opened me to this whole new amazing world, which is the ocean. And ever since I was 13, I've been completely obsessed. And I'm sure divers tuning in will know that it is an addiction and you just want to go to the next place and see the next animal. Um, but I still had a fear of sharks, even at that age, just because of the media. Um, and I remember seeing a white tip reef shark um, when I was in Indonesia when I was 16 and being so scared of this, you know, the white tip reef sharks behind me, like so scared of them when actually they're just like puppies of the ocean. But it was only when I was uh, 17, I was in the Philippines and I dived with the uh, thresher sharks and I had a really amazing encounter with a thresher shark. And I got very close with it and had that personal connection that intimate connection for me i would say a little bit more of a spiritual connection and um after that my my love for and fascination for sharks was sparked you know this creature was intrigued by me and i didn't feel threatened at all in yeah. this whole encounter um and so after that i just went a bit mad about sharks and the ocean and wanting to learn so much about it um and also just as i'm an artist um i sort of married the two together and yeah and then i went and did my dive professional um i really i wanted to improve my diving skills um and then yes yeah, so now i'm today painting the ocean diving the ocean um and combining my two loves for adventure and art together to hopefully raise awareness about these amazing beings and hopefully um, you know, for the people who don't want to dive and don't want to necessarily dive with sharks, I mean, I can do that for you, but um, hopefully my work can bring you to the ocean and make you form those connections without getting your feet wet. But um, yeah, so that's kind of my little backstory. Your artwork is incredible as well. Um, like, if anyone who's watching and hasn't seen Francesca's artwork, you can access her Instagram off this live obviously stay and watch the whole life um but uh after you can click on um francesca's profile and check out her artwork it is unbelievably thank beautiful um, so kudos yeah you do such a good job <laughs> thank you um and how long have you been an artist have you been an artist your whole life has art been like a major part of your life yeah, I mean, since word go, I was born to create. Um, luckily, my mum's an artist, so from a very young age, I guess I was very much encouraged. Oh, wow. I'm, a, I'm a twin, my sister's a marine biologist, so I think from a young age, they saw that she was definitely going in like the science direction. I'm definitely going in the creative direction. So I was very much encouraged from a young age. And for me, it was all I wanted to be and I, all I will be. <laughs> I will be creating to the day I die. So um yeah <laughs> wow that's pretty awesome um and did you always have like this talent or did, did you take lots of art lessons or was this kind of like a extracurricular thing like how um, did the kind of grow i think um when people comment saying oh you're so talented i feel like it kind of annoys me a little bit because I think we all like everyone's born with a natural gift. So obviously my gift was definitely a uh, creative side. I think the creative side of my brain is a lot more wired to like the sort of math side, let's say. But um, for me, I, had, I was born with like a foundation layer. But if I never decided to work upon that layer, I would never get to the point that I am today so you know I, I paint every single day and that's why I tell people like every single day I do something creative and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of hours so I mean since I picked up a paintbrush at like the age of three I've been painting so um, I guess there is talent involved but also uh, thousands of hours of hard work <laughs> um, and I'm also just I just love it I love what I do so um, if I don't if I go a day without creating I just yeah. feel weird <laughs> Yeah, practice makes perfect, hey? You, you've been uh, practicing a long time. <laughs> For sure. Um, 
And what would you say your favourite thing that you've ever painted is? Gosh, it's constantly changing because uh, I'll love the thing that I'm painting at that moment. Well, I have like love-hate relationships with my work. Sometimes I love it, sometimes I hate it. And I usually like, I'm really proud of a piece for like a week after it's finished. And I'm like, okay, on to the next, on to the next. <laughs> gotta keep going, gotta keep going. But um, I mean, <laughs> my work takes anywhere from 30 to 500 hours to do. I've just embarked on a massive project that might take me about a year. It's wow. a two meter long painting of, the, of, of a coral reef. So um, for me, I mean, I have slight OCD. I love detail. I'm obsessed with detail. Um, so my work takes a very long time, but it's a labor of love. And I'm, I, I always love the work at the end of it, if I've put more time into it and more energy. But I think my favorite piece at the moment has to probably be this one behind me, just because um, it's also illustrating Cocos Island, which is one of my favorite places in the world to dive. If you've been, it's full of sharks. So um, painting, it's kind of a sort of, especially now seeing that I can't dive or I can't travel, travel because of COVID. It's kind of like, I don't know, transporting myself back to that moment where I was in the water with all the sharks around me in heaven. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow, that's pretty cool. Would you say that, that sharks are your favourite thing to um, paint as well, then, your favourite species to paint? Um, once again, that's always changing. I love sharks. I find them not just beautiful to see in the water, but also um, very beautiful to paint. Um, they're just their skins full of so many different colours, so many different shapes, sizes, personalities, and I love their eyes as well. Um, but at the moment, I think my top, like, four things to paint would be obviously sharks I'm obsessed with toucans at the moment I just can't they're just awesome I, I was in Costa Rica two two months ago and I spent a lot of time with toucans so my love for toucans has grown <laughs> um I love turtles they're so <laughs> amazing to see in the water I just love their their um, skin and their shell kind of reminds me of like mother nature's abstract painting and they're also just so much fun to paint like for someone who loves detail there's just so many things to do um and what else yeah, I also love parrotfish <laughs> which I'm drawing in this one it's a new love of mine <laughs> nice nice yeah so a range of marine species is, is it so Obviously, like, um, you focus mainly on marine species. Have you always focused on marine species? Um, the marine species was a focus after I learned to scuba dive. But prior to that, I didn't have any intention of going in the ocean. I mean, even, like, going to the beach, I wouldn't really go into the ocean. I had that much of a phobia. Um, but growing up, I was obsessed with tigers and wild wow. cats. And I still love tigers, and I'd love to see them in the wild one day. But um, for me, it's all about gaining, gaining those personal connections and those encounters for my work. And so I haven't seen a tiger yet in the wild. I'd love to one day, maybe when that day happens, I might start painting cats again. But uh, for now, it's all about, um, I have so many amazing encounter stories that I just want to paint. Um, so yeah, I mean, growing up, it was na it's always been nature. Um, it's just, I think it's constantly evolving as I'm growing. Yeah. Would you say that, like, nature then is, is your inspiration for your painting? You know, yes. Like, animals? Yeah, I mean, people ask me, like, who, who's your yeah. favourite artist? And my answer is always Mother Nature. I mean, you can't beat her. Every artist since inception has looked to her for inspiration. And she just amazes me every single day, just even as simple as a flower or a bee, like I'm seeing at the moment. It's just, you know, you can't, you can't beat Mother Nature. Yeah, yeah. So when you paint, do you use, because you use photography as a tool, right? Um, I've seen some of your photos and they're pretty cool. Uh, how, like, how did you get into that? Was that a kind of a natural progression or was that kind of a, um, a tool in terms of like capturing the moment and then being able to paint that later on? Um, like how did that kind of evolve? Um, I've always been interested in photography. It kind of runs in my family. My great grandfather actually opened one of the first photography studios in London. So I've always had this thing like with photography wow. in my family. Um, and so uh, growing up, like when we were going on our hiking holidays, my dad would always give me his camera and I'd just snap away. I don't know if they were good shots, but 
Um, I have an eye for composition and color. I think that's just something I'm naturally good at. So photography, um, I naturally kind of took okay photos just because as an artist, I kind of understand how to sort of position things, what looks good. And that's kind of what it was, my relationship with photography growing up. But it was only when I um, did my dive masters and my dive instructors, I had a little camera with me. Um, it was just a point and shoot, nothing too fancy, but um, I would always bring it on every single dive and um, I'd be seeing these awesome things and I started being able to capture them. And at first they weren't very good photos, but um, as that progressed, because I didn't do much painting when I was working in the dive industry, I didn't have much time or energy, but photography was kind of like my creative outlet. But I'm so happy that I had that time to do photography because a new love for a new art kind of came about it and also just like being able to for me at first it was just capturing the underwater world just to show my family and show my friends who don't scuba dive be, hey look at this turtle hey look at this and then um as I came back and decided to you know go completely professional with my art um I then used it as a tool I would go back through my massive library of photographs and um for me it's sort of using photography with my work it kind of adds more of a personal connection to it it's all for me it's all about telling stories in order to tell a story you need to go out and experience life to gain those stories and being able to capture what that would you know for example um how can i paint a shark if i can't photograph it you know i can't take my watercolor paints underwater so it's a beautiful way for me to capture the world around me and then be able to go back into my studio uh, we're in a m much more controlled environment um, to process it all. Um, but as as it's grown, like my love for photography has grown and I just find it such a an amazing and powerful tool um, to communicate the world and make people fall in love with it. Yeah, and you, you must start to get pretty good at photography as well to be able to capture like the colours and things like that to then be able to transfer them onto a canvas with painting, right? Yeah, for sure. And also just seeing the animals in real life. I think that like capturing it with your mind is the most important thing. Um, you know, on dives, you'll, you'll tend to find me staring at things, especially coral. I love just like hovering and staring at all the little coral, coral polyps. I feel like that's the only way you can really truly paint something is if you get that intimate and that close with the subject matter and see how the light bounces off it, how it reacts with other elements in the water um so yeah <laughs> yeah definitely um you so you were you mentioned earlier your 200 sharks project um how do you feel your uh art links with conservation um i think it definitely links with con conservation as in order to raise awareness about the environment that we live in you need art i mean the only way you can communicate you have science science is so vital and important but without the art to communicate that then no one's going to know anything about it and how can you make someone love a shark or a lion or uh, whatever it is in england for example if they don't go over and see it themselves they're going to they're going to watch a documentary they're going to see a painting they're going to see photography Art is so powerful in, in connecting the people to the environment, especially if it's such an alien world like the ocean, where a lot of people have never dived. And so being able to connect people with that environment that I fall in love with doesn't necessarily mean that you need to learn to scuba dive. But if you can start falling in love with them or great creating that passion to want to learn more, then, um, yeah, I mean, art is so, so powerful. And I always say, like, if you're a creative you don't need to necessarily be a photographer or a painter, but whatever creativity that you're into, whether it's, you know, writing poems or singing, um, use it because it's a powerful skill to be able to communicate that. I mean, art is the universal language. So I think art and conservation is very much in linked and you need both. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we get a lot of questions around like careers and people in different careers wanting to get more involved in the marine industry. And I think what you said is so true. Like we need so many people um, spreading the word in different ways. And it's not necessarily like photography or art or anything like that, but everyone has their own skill sets and their own talents and um, everyone exhibiting, uh, well, exhibiting 
talking about conservation exhibiting their own talents but using their kind of skills and that avenue to talk about conservation and spread the word of it um as you said that's how you reach people that um can't get diving or um you know don't have access to amazing tropical waters and things like that um with these incredible species in and might not ever get to see a great white shark themselves kind of thing um which most people don't um so yeah i think it's so important um that everyone uses their um own ways to talk about conservation and, and grow that so from a career this perspective as well um when we get asked <laughs> questions around that um we always try and say like everyone you don't necessarily have to be in marine science to be involved in conservation in marine conservation you can be from a completely different background and still be very much involved in it um mm. it's always important to remember that one um you sound like you've dived a lot and um <laughs> a lot. uh where have been your favorite spots uh my favorite spots yeah i've been very fortunate in the past years to be to some really cool places uh, my mind is like every time i see a new place it's like my my mind expands even more um but i think my top sort of few that are really really stood out to me was the great barrier reef i was in heron island last year and that was really amazing especially you know the media paints the great barrier reef as this dead place in the world everything's dead and it's like no it's, it's not dead when i was there i saw amazing coral reefs and a lot of it is bleaching um but there is still hope and i think when people they see bleached coral they think that's dead no the coral's still very much alive it's just on its last legs um so you know the media once again painting a very bad image on such a beautiful ecosystem so heron island 100% um and i was in cocos island last year too which is a little island in the pacific ocean um it's uh, owned by costa rica and um it's a shark paradise <laughs> you're in the middle of nowhere uh very crazy waters crazy currents uh adrenaline fueled dives uh, and sharks everywhere you've got schooling hammerheads you've got tiger sharks galapagos sharks this is based uh painting behind me is based in cocos island they have so many white tip reef sharks i've never seen so many white tip reef sharks in one place in my whole life <laughs> and they're all just i i think i grew a love for white tip reef sharks i'd never thought i had um so i think those are some of my top places also komodo uh, <laughs> national park that's an amazing place especially for mantas and the corals there were just breathtaking um just so colorful and vibrant and just so much life uh you know there's so there's still so much left to fight for and i think that's something that especially i want to try and highlight with my work i want to highlight the beauty of nature so you can fall in love with it and hopefully want to protect it yeah definitely uh, and some of your posts were have talked about like the shark fin trade and you've obviously got your 200 sharks project um how did that kind of like evolve i assume that was like related to your travels um and seeing some shark finning and things going on and obviously you you want to protect um the species um mm -hmm. so yeah how did that 200 sharks project evolve and like what how, how have you been involved in like the kind of anti finning movement if you like um is it is evolving through just my fascination for sharks as well as what's happening in this world and the more i learn the more there is to do um and so with the projects um my aim heron island 100% um and i was in cocos island last year too which is a little island in the pacific ocean um it's uh last year too which is a little place it's like my my mind last year too which is a little you see of them and whether that's through photography or paint or storytelling um and um as the project is progressing i really want to get involved with more conservation work um and last year i was with shark girl madison that's her instagram handle um i'm sure maybe a lot of people have heard of project haiu which is an amazing project um where she is implementing ecotourism into a shark fishing fishing village in indonesia um and i went along and helped create a shark kind of coloring book mural in the uh, local school 
which was a really amazing experience. It was in their library. Um, in the school, they don't teach art or it's a very, you know, very impoverished place. Um, but I went and spent, I had four hours to create kind of a line drawing on the wall. I wanted it just to be like a coloring and book and then get the local children involved to, to help color it in. Um, cause I, you know, I just think I don't want to just be an artist that paints a pretty picture then goes home. I want to leave something that can grow and evolve. And so this way, um, you know, I've left like a basic outline and all the kids can just start filling in the rest. And apparently they've, they've been continuing the painting in, in the room, which is, you know, great. But, um, that was an amazing day painting this shark, this mural with, alongside shark fishermen and their children and understanding that it kind of opened my mind to you know these aren't the evil guys these guys are just like you and me you know they don't have a lot of money and this is the only way that they can make money it's not clear that they're the evil people um and that was you know it was a really amazing opportunity for me to kind of understand more about that movement also uh, talk to madison she her mind is crazy she knows so much about uh, a lot more than me about sort of the shark fishing and finning movement but um no, there, there is hope. Um, I'm trying to, I always try and stay positive with it, but definitely Project Hayu is just an amazing project. I'm hopefully, you know, in 2021, if anyone's watching this, please go along and try and be on one of her trips. Um, all the money really goes to such an amazing place. Um, and also the, these shark fishermen, like, um, they are so welcoming of us. You know they can make a lot more money from ecotourism and they enjoy it a lot more they get to interact with people and you know they don't need to go off and go into illegal waters and shark f fish that they don't even want to sh like um sorry fish shark that they don't even want to so yeah um but as the project's at its infancy so um i had planned a few things for 2020 obviously uh with what's happened um they have been cancelled but i'm hoping for 2021 um some really exciting uh, conservation things can can happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think like well, we have the same situation here in terms of like the shark finning um, trade and and the shark fishermen here and and moving from shark fishing over and transitioning the community into um, sustainable ecotourism. And I think it's it's exactly what you said. Um, because we've had a lot of people kind of um, read about what we do um, or hear about what we do and, and almost villainize the shark fishermen. And then you have to remember that these people don't have um, another source of income. It's a very poverty stricken area. We are in rural Mozambique here. Um, there aren't like a million sources of income. It's um, got like our areas 70% unemployment rate. Um, and poverty is like extremely high average age in school is 12 or 13 uh, um, and all families do not like there's literally maybe a handful of families that have running water and electricity in their house um so people don't have options um and fishermen any fisherman is just fishing because they're trying to make a living right um apart from obviously like recreational anglers but when i'm talking about the fishermen here i'm talking about um the fishermen who are fishing to earn a living uh, um and be able to feed their families and the shark fishing is just a means to end the reason that they do it is for the shark fin trade which is a much greater problem um with over 100 million sharks being killed every year um for yeah a non-essential um dish um and it's killing off so many sharks and causing crashes in species numbers left, left right and center um but again the fishermen that are actually on the ground doing that in a lot of the less economically developed countries aren't getting paid loads they're just it's just a job so mm -hmm. if you can provide alternate source of income like ecotourism or we have some alternative livelihoods plans like honey harvesting and aquaponics and stuff but basically if you can provide an alternate source of income to the shark fishing they're not fishing sharks because they love killing sharks they're just trying to make a living right mm -hmm. um so that kind of thing's really effective um and being able to inspire like what you did with the painting and stuff being able to inspire the next generation um the kids is a really crucial um cog in like the whole machine of moving towards a more sustainable future yeah. um so yeah it sounds sounds like what you were doing is 
very useful and hopefully the kids have found it very enjoyable as well yes. yeah and I, hopefully their future isn't shark fishing hopefully their future involves ecotourism and other you know edu- uh, they also aren't educated as well so madison is also bringing school teachers to the island to educate the children that's also such an important thing as well yeah 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 definitely education is key any conservation strategy worth its salt um that's doing any kind of conservation work that involves humans which is pretty much all conservation work given that almost every environmental problem is caused by humans <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're not great <laughs> um <laughs> yeah um so yeah education is key next generation this generation all of everyone's work what we're doing right now talking about this online and, and people tuning in and listening um, and talking about having that conversation around conservation it's so important and and your work and our work and everyone that's doing any kind of work with conservation it's so important just to spread the word and raise awareness because that at the end of the day is how you're going to get more people um taking action towards a more sustainable future i'd like to add to you something you've said something that sort of sparked um, um something um so i think a lot of people ask me personally they're like how do you get into conservation and i don't necessarily class myself in conservation i think it's a big umbrella you know and you don't necessarily need to i think have this idea of going working for an actual conservation group to be in conservation you know what i'm doing and creating work to raise awareness about this amazing planet that we live on that's technically some type of conservation effort and so I think hopefully I can inspire people to just you know we're we're in lockdown at the moment this is a you don't need to necessarily go out why don't you use your skills whether that's a creative skill or not in the comfort of your home to raise awareness that is conservation as well so um I think I don't know I think there's a, a very much a, like a romantic idea of what conservation is and I think it's thrown around a lot when actually all that conservation is is raising awareness and helping to protect this planet and so you can do that literally from from your home um and that's what i'm doing at the moment especially with lockdown so yeah yeah definitely the term conservationist as it has evolved a lot over the years and i think it used to mean um that you had like a science degree and you worked in conservation science but conservation science is very different to conservation um and you can be a conservationist without a scientific degree um you can be a conservationist with any background um and any age as well um and it does just mean being passionate about conserving it doesn't necessarily have to be the oceans obviously for us love the oceans <laughs> um, then we would encourage you to be passionate <laughs> yeah <laughs> whatever um, you're interested in i'll just if your thing is like forests yeah exactly like uh, if it's terrestrial systems great whatever the world needs more conservationists yeah um, for sure so yeah it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have a scientific background or anything like that um volunteering your time passion. helping out with ngos like we take volunteers here um yeah if you've got passion then then that's what that's what is needed that is the main people always ask me what you, what do you need to work in the conservation world passion and resilience yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never do give up think. never give up because pardon you said never give up yeah and yeah yeah exactly and especially as unfortunately a lot of like the conservation news um in the current world that we're living in isn't necessarily good news um so resilience is really key to be able to kind of keep going and stay motivated and and continue doing whatever you're doing no matter how big or how small uh, and the thing that you're doing whether it's just you know helping out once a month or whatever if you can help out a local conservation organization or even if you're volunteering abroad or you know working on one of our projects or anything like that then um as much or as little as you can do uh, we need more conservationists on this planet so <laughs> get involved mm-hmm. <laughs> um which uh yeah so actually you mentioned that you were in australia right at the great barrier reef um and we saw on your instagram that you'd been in queensland at a research station 
um what what were you doing there um so as i said earlier my sister my twin sister she's uh, the marine biologist so she specializes in um coral conservation and restoration um and so yes yeah, she works at the research station and they're they're allowed to bring guests or volunteers so i was able to come with her but um i also worked with them um, uh the university of new south wales um in documenting what they were doing out there through uh photography and creative outlets so um i was i was i was helping her um with the with the projects i mean you need a lot of hands-on i mean scientists work very long hours i have a lot of respect for you guys um she was up late nights documenting corals at like 12 midnight because it needed to be dark and yeah she she works very hard so i was helping her with that and also going out and taking photos for the research station so i was there for just under a month and it was a really amazing experience and opportunity and i've never been i mean you get close with up close with corals on a dive but i've never been that personal with coral i mean like seeing it underneath the microscope also i mean i, I know a lot about it just from my sister just we, we chat a lot and I, I do a lot of research but spending time at the research station like my mind just blew like grew with all the knowledge i was gaining just from learning about corals and also seeing the experiments and seeing what happens and talking to the other researchers on, on at the station it was a very valuable experience for me and also just a very magical one i mean i saw baby turtles hatching i saw millions of birds i saw rays sharks lots of corals it was a it's a really magical place um so yeah luckily i didn't see any bleached coral though so i was very lucky to see a pristine world yeah. Yeah, Queensland, Queensland is a beautiful part of the world. I was um, there in 2017 uh, yes. and it's just like stunning, really, really beautiful. Um, it's like your, your classic tropical, if you Google tropical coral reefs, then it's pretty much Queensland that comes up, which is, um, yeah. yeah, really, really cool. Um, yeah. Um, then we were talking earlier about like careers and stuff like that, which kind of all was it leads into what we ask our guests at the end, which is um, advice for because you work across basically a few different industries um, with your photography and conservation work and art artwork. And what do you do? You have any advice for like um, young storytellers? Uh, people looking to get into similar um, a similar industry to what you do um, yeah like what would be your advice so my advice would if you've got the passion you're already sort of a few heads above everyone else like you need to have that fire in you to want to protect it like I will spend the rest of my life doing what I do just because I love it so much and the more I explore and the more I paint the more love that grows within me but I think um, in terms of my story and where I started, I mean, I'm lucky now that sometimes I get paid to go places to explore, which I'm very grateful for. But at the beginning, I mean, I'm not a rich artist. All of my pennies go back into my work, back into the conservation, back into going out and exploring the world. So I think if you want to start, I mean, a good place to start is to go on a trip like Project Hayu and learning more about that well whatever you're interested in if, if it's not the ocean if it's something else then go and go and do that and save your pennies and go out there and see it for yourself because honestly going out and exploring the world it's amazing the people that you meet when you sort of tell the universe what you want and then you go out there you'll meet some people that are going to change your life um but to never give up and to always if you're an artist watching watching this just create every single day and um good things will come you just need to have the passion <laughs> and the fire within you <laughs> to keep going um and also um just go and volunteer like with you with you guys in uh, mozambique just go off and volunteer for a few months um and that your journey will definitely um begin so but i mean if you're if you're a young person watching this um and at your at your home it's you know locked down and you don't really know what to do you're stuck i guess and you're staring at blank canvases just just start by painting your favorite i don't know favorite creature and just start there that's what i did 
I just started painting sharks and then it kind of just led into this crazy project <laughs> and it all just happened from diving with one thresher shark in the Philippines and then painting a few sharks going oh I kind of like this <laughs> and then it's kind of just sparked onto there so yeah <laughs> Yeah, having that experience and, and yeah, getting inspired, I guess, can be really eye-opening. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We have um, a lot of humpback whales out here. Uh, amazing. Our, our whale migration is huge um, between June and October, and uh, we always find people come out here. And it's one thing, like, reading about it in a book. Um, it's another thing, seeing it in real life, and it's just... Yeah you well know um pretty incredible to see mm. these incredible animals that are just mind-blowing yeah to see them in action yeah. is incredible yeah for me like sharks are what got me into marine biology um and don't get me wrong I'm still absolutely crazy about them but hardback whales now are I think because they're they're just so intelligent they're mammals they're also massive <laughs> um oh. They're super cool to see in the water, and they're definitely a very close second for my uh, favorite animals, and um, because they are just yeah, so inspirational. I've um, never seen a whale. That is the one amazing. thing um, I'm going to try and make happen in the next year. <laughs> I, I, I've seen I've seen one humpback in Costa Rica from the boat. Um, and I saw it for 10 seconds. It was just coming up to breathe and was going. And I, I mean, I got a tear in my eye just from the 10 seconds. So God help me when I see one in the, in the ocean. But um, yeah, no, I, I would love to see whales. And I'm sure when that day happens, I think maybe a lot, there'll be a lot more whale art. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you're always welcome to come out to Mozambique. <laughs> I was reviewing our data the other day, and uh, in our high season, we averaged eight, I think it was eight to 11 sightings per hour wow. from the boat. Uh, from land, you can see a lot more, but obviously it's further away. Um, That's so amazing. It's a lot closer up. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty cool because we do active research in the whales. Um, so it's acoustic research and um, visual. So behavioral cue, we're looking at behavioral cues and then linking that to what we hear underwater. So we have um, hydrophone underwater microphones. Um, and we basically, we're looking at, we're doing an observational study based on like human wildlife interactions because we work with the World Cetacean Alliance and have developed guidelines for the, this area on like how to ethically interact with humpback whales and um we got to the point last year where you could pretty much predict like this uh, our scientists could pretty much predict um whale behavior like wow down to a t it was pretty cool like i remember being with them we had two photographers out here and we went on um we went out to get some shots of some whales and stuff and and this mating pod um came up real close to the boat um and his mating pods are like pretty aggressive and really confident like they didn't give a shit about the boat being there and um yeah. we'd like we we were abiding by our regs and everything and the, and the whales just came straight wow. over and, um and um it, i got to the point where i was like and breach that and breach that and breach that and I could and it was great oh, wow. they just could just point their camera and be like shoot 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, when's um, when's high yeah, season in Mozambique watching um June to November so um like safe safe season in terms of like you will absolutely 100% see a humpback whale um now i've said that <laughs> um will be like august september october mm -hmm. um well july as well but our peak on our according to our research uh, um peak month is august um so but i mean you've still got like i can i sit on my porch during whale season and count the blows uh from the whales while i eat breakfast like you can see wow. whales quite easily here it's not it's not um it's not unusual basically well maybe uh, in 2021 i'll come over yeah, and see, yeah. <laughs> say, give a visit yeah definitely definitely come out yeah oh, i mean I it's pretty that. that'd be awesome incredible to see 
how they like it's pretty incredible to see how they change their behavior in the presence of humans because like um yeah if you turn the boat engine off they'll pretty much come so we have like a 300 meter caution zone um so you drive slower and then a 100 meter exclusion zone so you don't go closer than 100 meters to the whales yeah um so we'll get to the 100 meter mark and then turn the engines off um, and turn like alongside so we're not drifting or anything towards them but what you'll notice is actually that as soon as you turn the engine off and obviously the noise stops in the water the humpback whales actually change their direction and come to the boat um so we yeah. actually had a, a baby whale i think it was a couple of years ago now that just was repeatedly breaching towards oh the boat gosh. and it got that's <laughs> adorable um that sounds amazing oh yeah that was crazy and <laughs> It got to the point where I was, I was sat next to my friend and I was like, uh, so what do we do if it doesn't stop breaching and it just breaches onto the boat? Uh, but touch wood, we've never had that happen. So, and it just um, went back underwater and then swam around the boat and I looked over the side and it's, yeah. I was just there staring at, at me. Wow. Um, so what yeah, the whales are like, man. That's awesome. I would definitely recommend. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, every year they get more interactive and stuff, and um, yeah, it depends on like the pod formations and stuff on how um, brave they are feeling and how what their interactions with August have been and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible to see. Anyway, I got super distracted when talking about whales. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> whales are awesome. <laughs> Um, um, so we have some quick fire questions um, that we do with all our guests so do you mind if we just run through them um, okay. and then we can wrap up cool perfect okay um, so first question what is your favourite ocean creature sharks <laughs> if you had already guessed <laughs> <laughs> Um, and what's your favourite day of the week? Uh, Monday. Because it's like, you know, fresh new, it's like a cha new, new chapter. So I like Mondays. Says a person who loves their job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that is true. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, plastic free, eco free product that you can't live without. A uh, tote bag, a uh, bottle, and well, the, the coffee mug things. Oh, and the bamboo toothbrush, and oh, there's loads. But yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favourite beach in the world? Um, my favourite beach is, I don't know what it's called, but there's a few very magical beaches in Costa Rica where you have thick rainforest, black sands, crazy waves, and then probably a rainbow or a sunset. So yeah, the, the beaches in Costa Rica are just mind-blowing, magical. Wow. Sounds gorgeous. Um, and what was the last song you listened to? Um, I don't know, but um, the last album was the new Tame Impala, which I was listening to today, and it's awesome. I don't really know what the songs are called at the moment, but yeah. I'd go check out that album. <laughs> um, and dolphins or sharks? Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and your favourite holiday? Uh, probably diving. <laughs> if it's involving the ocean, um, nice. I love Any it. <laughs> any specific location oh gosh i mean i don't really I've, oh god i mean i guess the last place i was at was costa rica so i guess costa rica at the moment but it's always changing <laughs> um uh, would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to speak to animals speak to animals 100 percent That'd be awesome. Imagine being able to talk to sharks. Oh my gosh. 
it will make photography a lot easier. Yeah, it's like, can you just like stay still for like two minutes, just so I can take this one photo? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Swim back that way again. Okay, actually, you, you, you two mantis, can you just like uh, just stay in that part of the ocean, please? Just you know, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> what book would you t take with you on a desert island? Um, oh gosh, what book? Well, I don't know. It would probably be um, Leonardo da Vinci is one of my favourite artists. And since a young girl, I've been just, he has influenced me so much with my work. And like when I was a very young girl, I just would copy all of his work. So probably one of just like a picture book, just so I can like get inspired. Probably not, I'm not huge into reading. I'm more into visuals. So probably a picture book, that sounds so bad. <laughs> but uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely, definitely okay if it's a Da Vinci book. <laughs> um... And first thing you're going to do after lockdown? Um, get in the ocean, if I can. 100%. <laughs> nice. And last question, as a superpower, teleportation or breathing underwater? Breathing underwater, 100%. That would be amazing. Like, no more scuba gear, no more holding your breath. <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> yeah. It would make life a lot easier. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Thank you very much for joining us. Do you have anything that you want to um, tell our audience about? Any upcoming projects that you got? Anything that they should watch out for on your socials or anything like that? Sure. Um, I can just talk about the projects that I'm working on at the moment. I have three big projects. I have obviously the 200 Sharks project, but that's just like the lifelong mission of mine. So that's going to be a never ending project. Um, I also have a project called Where Two Worlds Collide, and it's based on my adventures in Costa Rica over the past year, especially looking at the relationship land has with the ocean. So I'm creating kind of this crazy, wild, colourful, vivid um, series of um, animals interacting with each other that would usually meet. For example, like I have a painting with a toucan sat on a turtle type of thing. So kind of like Dali inspired, I guess. And then um, I'm also working with the Ocean Agency. Earlier on, I said I'm working on this huge two meter long painting. So I'm working with the Ocean Agency where uh, I can't show too much of it yet, but um, it's a two meter coral reef scene that will probably take me um, the re for sure the rest of the year. Um, but it's hopefully to raise lots of awareness about what's happening with the corals and also make people fall in love with them. I feel like they're very much overlooked um um in the media so uh yeah those are the three projects that i'm doing at the moment and obviously you can follow me um to follow along on those wow awesome yeah um so anyone that's tuned in right now um and didn't catch the whole uh live this will be available on our youtube afterwards um and there's a link in our instagram bio um you can catch the previous q a uh, guests there as well um and yeah if you've got any questions, then um, you can shoot us a message um, and you can message Francesca on Instagram as well. Her Instagram handle should be in the top left corner of this live. So go and give her a follow um, and you can follow us as well, obviously. Um, and yeah, we've got an upcoming project in June. We're going to be announcing that tomorrow. Um, it's a sustainability challenge. Um, so everyone can get involved from home and um challenge each other on how to live more sustainably sustainably and there's going to be a different theme each week so we will be unveiling that very shortly um awesome. but yeah thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, Francesca. thank you for having me uh, no worries have a great evening yeah you too thank you all right see ya